This is Duke University. My name is Erdan Göktar and I'm a professor of Turkish and Middle Eastern Studies at Duke University. And I'm here today with Professor Sibel Bozdoğan, who is the head of the architecture department at Kadir Haas University and also a faculty member at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, we've been having a number of conversations about global cities over the semester and um, we are turning to Istanbul in this particular section and uh, Professor Bozdoğan is an expert on Istanbul. So we've had a number of conversations, we've seen some films and we had a very interesting talk last night. And I wanted to continue the conversation uh, by talking a little bit about uh, the Gezi protests which happened in the spring and early summer of 2013. And we wanted to talk a little bit about, um, Sibel, if we could, a little bit about uh, the, the, the architectural and urban space related to mm -hmm. the protests themselves. So maybe you could give us a sense of how urban space is involved in those particular protests on a number of levels. Uh, sure, yes, Erda. Um, as many of your audiences probably know, Gezi protests erupted uh, out of the plan of the government to redevelop that park uh, as a new shopping mall slash new development. Um, just to give a little history of the park, uh, the park was a result of Henri Prost's master plan for Istanbul. In the, uh, the plan was approved in 1939 and uh, the implementation was through the early 1940s and the artillery barracks, the Ottoman artillery barracks that stood there since mid-19th century uh, were by that time quite derelict and uh, the courtyard of the barracks were used as a soccer field in fact and um, so these were incrementally torn down and the new park was laid out. It was this European style, very geometrically ordered, um, spacious uh, park that is a symbolic representation of the new Republican secular space, uh, along with the Taksim Square, which is another major legacy of, uh, of Prost. Uh, so in that sense, the park has a very significant symbolism in the Republican history of the city. And when this new project came up, um, also, by the way, the new project was part of a larger Taksim Square mm -hmm. redevelopment idea where uh, traffic is to be taken underneath the square, uh, the whole square is pedestrianized. So when this project came up, um, it was in a way uh, clearly not necessarily just about the cutting of the trees, but a much larger ideological project of the, this government. And uh, Tayyip Erdogan, the prime minister then, repeatedly said that he would like to rebuild the barracks and he would like to tear down the Atatürk Cultural Center, which is the modernist uh, project, again from 1960s onward, and also even build a new mosque on Taksim Square. So it was the part of a much larger idea, the Gezi Park redevelopment So project. if we think about that, in ter like metaphorically, if we're reading that space and those buildings, um, we have a space, <coughs> and this polemic came up uh, during the protests, where the old Ottoman barracks actually represented something <coughs> like a, a neo-Ottoman or a more conservative architectural vision, and the cultural center, which is one of the buildings, the famous buildings that are there, uh, represented a kind of more radical secular vision. Right. And right. in addition, the, what was missed in the international media was that aside from the park, in the development of the barracks was that a new mosque would be put in Taksim. And this, this right. is, um, for people who may not know, is, a, is an older polemic that goes back Absolutely. to the time when, when Erdogan when first... When Erdogan was first elected in 1994 as the mayor of Istanbul, that was one of his first ideas, to build a mosque in uh, Taksim Square. Uh, interestingly, he had presented this again with, a, uh, with, a, with respect to Europe. He, he used to say, you know, tourists come to this uh, country, they come to Taksim Square and they don't even know this is a Muslim <laughs> country. So that was part of his mm -hmm. argument. Um, but also the rebuilding of the barracks idea, um, its only significance for uh, this government is the fact that it's Ottoman. Otherwise, mm -hmm. architecturally, first of all, there are no survey drawings or very detailed documentation of that building. 
And many architectural historians and professionals agree that it is not a building that has great aesthetic or architectural merit. So it was just, uh, in Tayyip Erdogan's words, tarihin ihyas, the reconstruction of history to what it should have been in the first place, mm -hmm. which is a very interesting notion, but also with very troublesome questions, you know, because then you can ask who decides what, what is historical heritage? Why do we treat these barracks as historical heritage, but not Frost's Park? Those are the kind of questions that were raised by the Gezi events. Interesting. And, and who decides? And another point about the beginning of the park, we always get the beginning of the protest as bulldozers coming into Gezi Park, but you made a really interesting point in your talk last night that actually the day before uh, uh, Erdogan had been at the um, ceremony of the, the, the beginning of the building of the third bridge. Right. And that there was, so there, that, that immediately changes the scale and context. Absolutely. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, f uh, just a little note yeah. there. Actually, the beginning of the Gezi protests were a month earlier mm -hmm. with the oh. demolition of the Emek cinema, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is uh, this uh, art cinema inside the Circle Dorian building, which is another uh, redevelopment project. So that was a protest that was unsuccessful, but it erupted again a month later in Gezi. Uh, but you're absolutely right that in the end, what erupted in Gezi was uh, a much larger set of grievances uh, with a number of these new mega projects, including the third bridge and the northern Marmara Highway that's connecting to the third bridge and the third airport in the north. So all of these mega projects in the north are threatening the ecology of Istanbul in very serious ways. Uh, and there have been many other protests by citizens groups, uh, professional organizations, etc. But all of them has gone ahead. So the, yes, the third bridge had already started. So it was like, the Gezi was like the last drop in a set of accumulated grievances. And, and there, was a, there were a lot of forces of resistance there. And, um, you know, we had talked earlier about Turkey is an interesting example in the last 10 or 15 years of the convergence of a kind of Islamic conservatism mm -hmm. and a, a capitalist neoliberalism. Absolutely. So when people talk about justice and development, you know, the name of the ruling party, it is, a, it is meant to be a kind of Islamic justice perhaps and a capitalist development, which is sometimes lost, it's lost on my students and they're surprised to hear that when I, when I bring that up. The other interesting thing is we talk about larger trends in the Middle East is that there are parties that ad are now adopting both of those terms, both justice and development, in maybe the same vision from Morocco all the way into Afghanistan. So there, there's this idea that we're, we're moving away from perhaps a, a more populist understanding into a more capitalist understanding of, of Islam. I thought you could maybe talk about that and maybe the symbols of these things as they right. appear in architecture. Right. Uh, that shift uh, certainly did not start with AKP. It's, it goes to President Özal's ex uh, late Özal's time in 1980s. Uh -huh. This kind of export-oriented uh, neoliberal economic development strategy. But what is uh, significant with AKP is first the magnitude and the scale of this push towards making Istanbul a global city and marketing it as a global city by attracting capital, investments, tourists, etc. Uh, so in that sense, AKP has been truly the symbol of this dual forces of mm -hmm. on the one hand, global neoliberal urban trends, on the other hand, uh, rising Islamic identity consciousness. And in the physical space, the manifestation of this is uh, I consider like the shopping mall or the skyscraper as one side of the duality and Islamic style new replica mosques as the other side. So put them side by side and it will be a nice summary of the entire AKP project. You know, this this uh, idea of creating a country that is integrated with global markets but has a population that is conservative and Muslim and consuming public. So, so there's two new mosques that were built just recently, one the, the Mimar Sinan Mosque and then the Chamlija Mosque, which is currently being built, are essentially, um, they're taking uh, sort of the, the Ottoman Imperial uh, Mosque as a template, but in a sense expanding it, putting on top of it, an enormous scale in, in, yes. in places where it doesn't completely fit. So th I think that it was a really interesting point to talk a little bit about um, 
the social integration of the mosque in the classical era as opposed to what we have now, which is slightly different? Absolutely. Both, both of these mosques, well, Mimar Sinan Mosque, uh, the title Mimar Sinan, uh, is really a replica of uh, the great Selimiye, but it is lost in the middle of these incredible new housing development of Atashehir on the Asian side of Istanbul. So even its sighting and its location and its being surrounded by this enormous residential development is so different from the classical precedents. Uh, but Chamlıca Mosque, the really controversial one, was the pet project of Erdogan, basically. And even from within the Muslim community, there were many people who objected to it and wrote uh, pieces objecting to it, precisely because of what you said, because the classical Ottoman mosque gains its meaning from its community and from the Kulliye idea, you know, with all the soup kitchens and medrese and everything else. Whereas this one is a monumental mosque on the top of the Camlıca hill to which you have to drive in your car, park. And so it is a completely new concept, a symbol of uh, electoral power of Erdogan, basically, not, not a symbol of the Ottoman notion of mosque and kulli at all. And that's in general, I mean, one of the major criticisms of this period is that although there's a lot of rhetorical reference to restoring the Ottoman sense of space and neighborhood, etc., most of what is done is uh, really skin deep pastiche kind of references to that. Uh, and underneath it is really a whole new uh, capitalist neoliberal order. So in, um, uh, in your work, I think it's interesting to follow up on that, that, there, that you introduce a kind of tension between um, urban space and the city and the built urban environment and the power of the state in a way. And I think yeah. that's, a, that's a really interesting tension that exists sometimes uh, as a subtext in your work, sometimes in a very explicit way. But we, we seem to be in an era now that's, that's marked by the city eclipsing the nation. Uh, yeah. And that, you know, in the talk yesterday, you talked about the city being, Istanbul being the engine, really, of uh, Turkish modernity today. Okay. And in some ways, it, it leaves behind uh, the legacy of the era of the nation state and nationalism and the rise of the Middle East, right? So we're, we're leaving behind maybe a 100, maybe a 120 year period to go back to, to connect back to um, Istanbul and as the capital of an empire, yeah. and and uh, somehow that's the image that's being projected in in our modern moment, and I think that's interesting. I, I was I wanted to ask you a little bit about that tension between city and state. Absolutely, because uh, most of my earlier work, as you know, is on the early Republican period, and the uh, uh, guiding idea in that period was how do you bring modernity to the rest of Anatolia. That's why, for example industries, state industries were spread out in Anatolian towns, like Sümerbank being in Kayseri, Nazilli, um, cement factory being in Konya, etc. So the whole idea was distributing uh, industry and also there were all these projects for model villages. How do you make the village modern and so that the villagers stay there? That was the early Republican period. Uh, that started to change in the 50s first, and increasingly so, to such an extent that uh, most of the industry by the second half of the 20th century was already reconcentrating in the Marmara region, not just Istanbul, but the hinterland and of the whole Marmara region. So uh, the situation now is, as you said, totally reversed. And this was accompanied by massive rural to urban migration. So there was this influx into Istanbul of first industries and then of course the uh, labor mig migration uh, to find work in these industries. And that changed the entire character of the city from what in literature we call this shift from a shore city, a historic shore city that historically had expanded along its three shores uh, towards a really a mega city that is expanding more towards its hinterland. Uh, and in that, uh, the role of the state is extremely important because uh, what is very uh, now rampant with, uh, since AKP is in national government, uh, is uh, the privatization of public land and opening up new land to redevelopment. Because that's, that's really the key question, because so much land is public land in Turkey still. 
Uh, so this government saw an opportunity there uh, and is basically uh, opening uh, you know, much of public land to uh, redevelopment and itself partnering with private developers uh, for all of these new controversial projects. Uh, so I wanted to just touch upon the human costs of this urban renewal. Um, for example, in the film Ecumenopolis, there's a really interesting scene where um, in, a, in the Olympic Stadium, there's a concert going on. It's, it's you two singing in the concert, and that the people who have been displaced from that neighborhood to make the Olympic Stadium are actually watching the concert from the outside. Yes. They can't afford to be in the concert. Um. Are just listening from the outside, and uh, it's a very poignant moment where we get the the spectacle and branding of the global city on one hand and the displacement the and ones who are excluded from that on yes. the other um, yes. so in Istanbul how is that yeah. manifest that is what you're talking about is the Ayazma neighborhood episode yeah. uh, which was emptied for the Olympic uh, stadium thing uh, but also in the historic neighborhoods uh, specifically in a number of locations Tarlabashi is one Sulukule is the other uh, what is going on under this rubric of kentsel dönüşüm, urban renewal, if you like, is that a number of laws were passed giving the government, the greater municipality of Istanbul, the right to designate entire blocks as uh, renewal areas. And then um, this is uh, ostensibly this is for social rehabilitation, earthquake resistant construction. So the argument is that these are derelict neighborhoods that need renewal. But in, in the result, what happens often are uh, the displacement of the inhabitants of the neighborhood and uh, what Tuna Kuyucu calls a state-sponsored gentrification, which mm. brings uh, new groups into the neighborhood. And that kind of displacement has been going on. There are lots of studies on it. In the case of Slukule, it was the Roma, poor Roma community that were displaced and moved to 40 kilometers outside the city into standard uh, mass housing blocks by Turkey. In the case of Tarlabashi, it was mostly uh, Kurdish migrants, Africans, petty criminals, you know, the poorest and least powerful sectors of the society who are pushed out. Uh, in other words, the property owners have some power to negotiate with the new developer, but the tenants and the squatters and the poorest are immediately pushed out. So that is a very, very um, sad uh, social consequence or human consequence of what is going on. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the literature, uh, planners, uh, architects discuss how urban renewal can be done in ways without displacing the population, but that hasn't been the case in Istanbul. And that also feeds a kind of <coughs> resistance, which we then see kind of protests absolutely, ab abrupting. Absolutely, there were uh, a number of uh, resistances to renewal in Başıbüyük, uh, in some of the neighborhoods, um, which then uh, the government can use again as justification that these are troublemakers and we are cleaning up and we are bringing a new gentrified group to that. You know. Well, there's an important port point to be made there, which is that the, it gives justification for the state to then securitize and, in, and, and intervene with, it, with excessive police force. Yes. And so it's a, it's a sort of very negative cycle. Yes, that, it, is, that it is a vicious cycle of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, very good reasons why people rebel and then uh, repressing this rebellion increases the violence and then it increases the government's argument that, you know, these are all troublemakers. So I want to step back uh, and just talk a little bit about a larger trajectory of the development of Istanbul as a global city. And um, I'm currently working on a project that focuses on uh, the occupation of Istanbul ah, between 1919 19 and 1923. And there's a, there's a very well-known work, uh, a survey that was done in 1922, which was um, basically claiming that Istanbul, you know, it's not really a city mm -hmm. uh, at this point because it's, it's a number of isolated neighborhoods that are not connected, sometimes defined by religion or ethnicity. Uh, I want to tie that a little bit to what you were saying about Prost's plan, which seemed right. to be to integrate the city into, a, into a, a sort of cosmopolitan space that was unified. It, I don't know if th that seems to be a little bit utopian, but I, w I wanted to see what you thought about that, because we're on a moment now where the city seems very fragmented as yeah. well. Yes. Uh, the Pathfinder r report you mentioned, uh, the book, was uh, really the lowest point of Istanbul, because Istanbul, after its booming cosmopolitan imperial era at the turn of the century, from a 
population of 1,300,000. Uh, when we come to the mid-1920s, it had declined almost by half. Uh, that's, of course, the result of many factors, years of war, fires, devastation, the moving of state bureaucracy to Ankara in 1923. Uh, and it had, most importantly, lost its dynamic sector of the economy, the non-Muslims who were uh, exchanged. So that was really the period when Istanbul was sort of a neglected city. Mm -hmm. Many fire-burnt areas were unbuilt. Uh, but also the city that had moved outside the historic peninsula was very dispersed. There were some Bosphorus mm -hmm. villages, a number of settlements here and there, but it wasn't connected. So you're right, uh, Henry Frost's main mandate was to reconnect the city with modern urban planning principles through an efficient road network. So the road network of Istanbul that we have today dates back to this idea of reconnecting fragments inherited from the Ottoman Empire. And that was also uh, the same idea that modernists in that time were developing uh, like Athens Charter, CIM, etc. So this efficient city of motor traffic. Yes, that was Prost's main mandate, and plus the making of public spaces, European-style parks. So as you say, you know, to turn it into a city in the European sense mm -hmm. was what Prost was expected to do. So when would you say that Istanbul became a modern city? Uh, uh, I would say uh, Prost's master plan is a representation of that mm -hmm. idea, and its implementation started in the 40s, uh, under uh, Mayor Kurdar's period, uh, and then there was the Second World War years, and when Menderes took over in 1950 under the Democrat Party regime, it was expanded to a massive scale. So a lot of roads were opened up, and in to some this was the making of the modern city, to others this was the destruction of Istanbul, from whatever way you want to look at it. So you use the term in your work of the Palimpsest city, Yes. Uh, so how would that apply? Well, Palimpsest city like uh, Rome and other such cities, these layers of history that are underneath the city from Roman, Byzantine, Ottoman into modern, which is always a conflict between new development and conservation. You know, every time you uh, start a new project, there's something underneath it. So it, uh, it needs a different kind of approach. I mean, we had an example of this recently in Yenikapu when mm. there was all these excavations for the uh, subway and the rail system hub. Uh, the port of Theodosius, the Byzantine port of 5th century, was revealed with these magnificent treasures and the construction was stopped, which is what happens in most, uh, you know, developed countries. You have to have archaeologists come in, work with the uh, but in the case of Turkey, you know, there was so much uh, haste that this kind of stopping of construction was a hindering of progress, according to Erdogan. So, mm -hmm. you know, we always confront this palimpsest city with each uh, new development, and that's another reason why in a city like Istanbul, you cannot uh, bulldoze and do new construction that fast. You know, you have to work with other specialists and work incrementally. Uh, so the same thing happened with Marmara Rai, right? It had to be delayed because of the yes. finding of uh, sort of relics, yes. ancient relics. Yes, so it's yes. It's interesting the way the development of the city constantly has to confront has its to past confront it. it's in, in a way that's, um, yeah. is, I think, fr frustrating to, to the developers. But that's yeah. the case of yeah. these cities, like yeah. Fellini's Roma in, yeah. the, in the film, you know, they run into catacombs. And yeah. Yeah. So, so as, a, as a point of conclusion, then, where, where do you see this leading? Because we're in the midst of this, and we have a number of kind of outlandish projects that are still um, yeah. um, e either being planned or just beginning, including you know, the third airport, the third bridge, the Canal Istanbul, et cetera. Is this sustainable uh, in the short or the long term? Uh, well, that's the question that worries everyone and certainly the experts because especially those projects you mentioned that are in the north are going to be disastrous in terms of its effects, you know, 72% uh, of Istanbul's water coming from those areas, all the ecological corridors, etc. Uh, so, but as we know, at least the airport and the bridge are, are going on. Um, so I don't really have a good answer to that, but the uh, discussion among experts is that 
uh, this is not sustainable in the long run and uh, you know some sort of economic uh, bust is inevitable at some point uh, and I always say it is ironic to wait for an economic uh, decline or a mm -hmm. crisis but that might be the thing to stop this incredible construction boom uh, that has all sorts of costs. We didn't talk about the human cost, for right. example, all these uh, deaths of construction workers. You know, Turkey is now uh, the leader in the number of industrial and construction deaths. So there's an ethical issue there as well that concerns the professionals. Um, so in that sense, I don't think it's sustainable in the long run, mm -hmm. uh, and it will be. S it is yet to be seen what the economic um. trends will turn out to be. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank it's you a fascinating for work. inviting me. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure.